So if we think about the, the pyramid of life, at the bottom here, we have an organism like ourselves, the, a human. And to, to function, to survive, this human is composed of multiple systems. Um, so in this example here, you can see a urinary tract system, but we have our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, our muscular system, to name a few. These systems work together, they collaborate to ensure that the human being can survive. But we can break these systems down to one level lower, and that is the organ level. And if we look at every system in our body, it is composed of multiple organs. So you can see here in this urinary tract um, diagram, the urinary tract is composed of the bladder, the kidneys, the urethra, and so on. And these multiple organs obviously make up this system. So when we look at the organ then as a basic unit, we can break this down even further to a tissue level. So an individual organ will be composed of different kinds of tissue. And any given tissue will be composed of many, um, probably millions of um, what we call cells. So we're breaking it down and the cell is what we call the most fundamental unit in life. So if we move beyond the cell, we have molecules like water molecules and beyond molecules we have atoms. So atoms are really chemically the most smallest, um, I guess the most smallest feature in life. But why we're drawn or why I was drawn to cells in particular is because this is the most smallest living unit in life, if you will. Okay. And we call it the most fundamental unit in life because a cell can exist outside of a human. So we can take a single cell and we can give it some food and give it the appropriate atmosphere with some oxygen. And that cell will replicate and um, it will grow. And in that way, it is different to molecules and atoms because these cannot grow and divide in that manner. So I'm a cell biologist and we focus at this level, the cellular level. And when we look at a single cell, um, basically you could have your own little pyramid for cells themselves because they are quite complex um, little creatures, if you will. So what you can see here is a schematic representation of a cell. So our body as a human is composed of millions to trillions of these cells. And I like to think of cells as um, little mini cities. And within these little mini cities, we have lots of compartments that we call organelles that have different functions. So I hope here you can see our favorite organelle, the mitochondria. And we call the mitochondria in the context of this mini city, the powerhouse, because this is where energy is generated. So this is the factory that creates energy and the rest of the cell uses this energy to survive. Some other compartments which are worth noting are this purple one. So this is what we call the nucleus. And this is where our genetic information is stored. This is where our DNA or our genes are stored. So in many ways, the nucleus is like the town hall because it contains this very crucial information that dictates the way the rest of this city will function and the way the rest of this city will survive. So underpinning this very basic unit in life is what we call um, the central dogma of life. And basically underpinning everything in this cell is this central dogma whereby the DNA that we inherit from our parents and is found in this purple part here, the nucleus, it has all of the genes that we inherit from our parents. So let's say it's estimated there's about 10,000 genes that make up a human. But the genes themselves don't really do anything in the cell. They exist there, but what they do is they um, are converted into a very important message by this process. It doesn't matter what this process is, just ignore it. They are converted into um, a message called RNA. And this RNA finds itself, find its way out of the nucleus to these little, little dots here. These are protein producing factories called ribosomes. And these ribosomes convert this message into a protein. And the protein is um, then targeted to the appropriate location in the cell where it can function. So it's important to understand this central dogma in the context of any disease, but also mitochondrial disease, because although we have 
mutations in, in genes encoding mitochondrial proteins. Ultimately, what that translates into is a non-functional protein or the lack of a protein at the level of the mitochondria. And because of this, the mitochondria cannot function as they normally would. And this results in a downstream pathology.